The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell. I am the Assistant Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. So thank you all so much for being here. Today's webinar is an introduction to the Adult Maltreatment Screening and Assessment Tools Inventory. Next slide, please. Before introducing today's speakers, I will go over some information about the APS TARC and a brief disclaimer here. The disclaimer says, the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by the WRMA, Inc. contractors and or speakers Findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services official policy. Next slide, please. And then just a quick note about the APS TARC. They are available to help APS programs in any way that they can. Um, their contact information will be displayed on the last slide at the end of the webinar. They work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Next slide, please. And then just a, a quick plug for the peer-to-peer -peer call. So please consider joining the APS TARC's peer-to-peer -peer calls. They, uh, they host three calls per month, one for investigators, one for supervisors, and then one for administrators. The schedule for the calls is up on your screen currently. Um, and you can also check out their website um, or email them at that email that'll be displayed at the end for additional information. Next slide, please. And the APS TARC also has a page on their website dedicated to COVID-19 and APS. Uh, there is a link to this page in a red box at the top of the APS TARC website. Um, there you will find information from the administration uh, for community living on grants, resource information, and a report on the impact of COVID-19 on APS programs that was recently completed. Next slide, please. All right, so I will provide some housekeeping information, um, some tech information, and then uh, introduce our speakers. So a PDF of the slides for today's webinar um, are available in additional resources are available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel. You can download them at any time during the webinar. So please use your computer speakers to access the audio for this webinar and adjust your speakers to your desired volume. Um, for this webinar, it is required that to, to use computer speakers. If you experience audio problems or aren't seeing the screen change, it goes blank or anything, um, we recommend exiting and then re-entering the webinar. Next slide, please. Um, all attendees are muted for the duration of the webinar. Please write in any questions or comments that you have in the questions box that's also located in your webinar panel. We'll be responding to technology-related questions in that panel, and then content-related questions will be monitored throughout the presentation, and I will read those aloud for the presenters to address at the end of the webinar. We'll get through as many of those as we're able to with the time that we have. This webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive an email when the recording is available on the APS Charter website. And then the last piece, um, all attendees will receive an automatically generated email from the, the technology system being used for today's webinar approximately 24 hours after the conclusion of the webinar, and it will have a link to a certificate of attendance that you can download. Next slide, please. So we have a quick poll uh, to get a, a better idea of who we have in today's audience. Andy, would you please launch that poll? Uh, certainly, I'd be happy to do that. So I've launched that poll and it is open on your screen right now. And the question is, which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Do you consider yourself an adult protective services professional, other social services professional, a medical professional, legal professional, or other, if you don't fit any of those categories. We will leave this up for a few more seconds to give everybody a chance to respond. 
you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you have problems clicking on your screen to vote, you might be in full screen mode and need to hit your escape key on your keyboard in order to vote. Um, but you can click directly on your screen to vote and let us know which of these categories you identify the most with. So I'm gonna leave it open for just a few more seconds and then we'll, I will close it out right now and share those responses with everybody. It looks like 60% of you consider yourselves APS professionals, 20% are other social service professional, 2% medical, 6% legal, and 13% as other. So I will close that poll out and I'll hand it back over to you, Karen. Wonderful, thanks so much, Andy. All right, next slide, please. Now I will introduce today's speakers. We will be hearing from multiple people today. We have with us Stephanie whittier Lyson from uh, who is an Aging Services Program Specialist with the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services in ACL, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We have Rob Bartolotta, who is the Deputy Director for Research and Analytic Support with New Additions Consulting and Mary Toomey, who is a consultant in elder justice and adult protective services. So thank you to our presenters so much for being here with us today. Thank you again to our audience. And without further ado, I will hand it off to you, Mary. Thank you so much, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today to talk about the uh, adult maltreatment tools inventory. It's a project that Stephanie, Rob, and I have worked on over the last couple of years, and it's very exciting, and so we're really happy to be here. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be talking about in our time together uh, in today's webinar. We want to review the process that we took for developing the tools inventory, um, including how tools were rated for their evidence base. Rob's going to talk a little bit more about establishing the evidence base for the tools. So we want you to understand sort of the thoughtfulness and consideration that was taken in, that went into deciding which tools were in the inventory and what kind of information, so how it was just, how it was organized and the information contained for each tool. And most importantly, we want to introduce you to how to use the tools inventory to find a tool that might work for you. But we also wanted to ask you some questions about your use of tools before we launch into talking about the tools inventory. So Andy, if you could launch the poll. Certainly. Read, do you want me to read it out loud? Oh, I can read it for you. Um, so this is just like the poll we had a second ago. You just vote by clicking directly on your screen. Do you use any adult maltreatment screening tools in your practice? Select one. All the time, most of the time, from time to time, hardly ever or actually never. Um, and we'll leave this open for just a little bit to give folks a chance to vote. Again, you vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you have any trouble, it might be because you're in full screen mode. You need to hit your escape key to get out of that. So we'll leave it open for about 15 more seconds, giving more people a chance to vote. <laughs> All right, I'm going to close it out in about five seconds. So get your votes in. All right, and I will share the results. It looks like 22% of you say all the time, 14% say most of the time, 24%, the biggest one from time to time, 19% hardly ever, and 20% say never. So I will hide those results now for us and turn it back over to you, Mary. Well, that's really interesting because there's actually, we're almost into into five, it, it's almost equal for each of those categories. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're so, so we have another question for you, which is going a little bit deeper. So those of you who said never probably won't participate in this polling question, but we were also interested in if you are using a screening tool, what kind of screening tool are you using? So Andy, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. And you can check multiples here. If you like, you don't have to just click one. Do you use a screening tool for a specific type of adult maltreatment, e.g. neglect, or for all types at once? And your options are all types, um, just financial exploitation, um, just self-neglect. Um, we have one for abuse, which would include all types of abuse, physical, uh, emotional, and sexual abuse, um, and then one for neglect as well. So we'll give 
folks a chance to vote on that. Um, leave it open for about 15 more seconds. We wish we could have had more options here to parse out the different kinds of abuse, but our system only lets us have five, unfortunately. So we have to put all types of abuse together into one. Um, so about five more seconds, and I will close that out now. We had about half the folks vote, and I'll share those results. 74% um, resounding uh, majority said uh, all types, 15% financial exploitation, 13% self-neglect, 10% abuse, and 9% neglect. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, so I... Uh, this tools inventory is one of several projects that ACL has funded over the last couple of years that um, have that are moving towards creating a, a support for adult protective services to create a foundation for evidence based practice in adult protective services. So I'm happy to turn it over to Stephanie Woody or Elias and now to from adult from the administration for community living to provide some background and context for the tools inventory. So Stephanie, over to you. Great, thanks Mary. Um, so hi and welcome everyone. Um, this slide will be familiar for any of you who've joined other presentations on which I present. And like Mary said, um, we like to begin by sharing ACL's vision for elder justice. The vision undergirds all the work that we do in the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services and all of ACL. Um, today, I specifically want to emphasize that um, this vision does include, as you'll see in the very first line, a, a multidisciplinary approach, a commitment to a multidisciplinary approach. And this is why you'll see that the tools that are in our inventory are not necessarily solely for APS use, but could be used by other professional groups as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Why did we begin this project? Um, well, we know the best way to intervene in the problem of elder abuse is to prevent it from happening in the first place, um, or we intervene as early as possible to prevent further harm. And we also know that despite negative impacts of maltreatment, it still appears to be quite underreported. So implementing effective methods to detect maltreatment, so to screen, and to identify risk factors for maltreatment is of critical importance and not just within adult protective services but screening and assessment for maltreatment should occur on the broadest level possible and moreover when screening and assessing for adult maltreatment the tools one uses should be tools that have been tested for effectiveness and demonstrated to yield accurate results we don't want to have too many false positives as people will stop using the tools. Um, so in 2018, uh, we at ACL contracted with New Editions Consulting Inc. to do just that, create an inventory of screening and assessment tools for adult maltreatment. Um, and that includes an analysis of their, of their evidence base. Next slide, please. Okay, so as Mary covered in the agenda for today, you'll learn more about the process for developing the inventory and what kinds of tools we looked at and what we found. And um, we envision the inventory to be used at least in two ways. Um, so first would be those who could be looking for tools to use in their program. So all of the tools in our inventory did receive a rating. And one thing to note is that we have an unsupported rating, which we are, um, well, that would mean there, the available evidence discourages the use of that tool. And we are very happy to report that none of the tools in our inventory were found to be unsupported. So that's a good thing. Um, and the second way we envision this to be used is that it's a catalog of tools that show promise for future research and validation. So just as no tools were rated as unsupported, no tool was rated as 
fully evidence-based. So there is still room for further validation of these tools for any researcher, PhD candidates, programs that are interested, that are looking for projects or want to continue to help um, move the evidence base forward. Um, and then finally, I just wanted everyone to know that today you're, you'll be pointed to where the materials live on the um, ACL, well, actually it's the National Center on Elder Abuse website, and it's in a zip folder. Um, however, we are working on converting those materials into an online searchable resource, and we expect that resource to be ready within the next three to six months. So for now, you'll have to be doing, you know, the download of the folder, um, but in the future, we hope to have that as a much more kind of real-time usable um, online resource. So with that, I will turn it over to Mary, who will start to describe for us how we created the inventory. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So before I do that, I wanted to just say just a word about like, what are we talking about when we say tool? Um, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking, like, have we clearly said what a tool is? And so I, I wanted to start there was just talking about what we're talking about is, is something that aids you in your work, aids you in accomplishing a task, um, something that is necessary to the sort of execution of your job. Um, and so an analogy that I was thinking of is that, so for a chef, for example, a sharp knife is a is an important tool for a chef, but a sharp knife does not make anyone a chef. The, the, the clinical judgment of the APS worker is whatever kind of tool you're using in the, to assist you in your work, the clinical judgment of the worker is, is aided, should be aided by the tool. So not every, um, not uh, the sharp knife doesn't make a chef, but a chef without a sharp knife, sharp knife is gonna work harder and maybe not have the results as good a result as they have if they would have a sharp knife. So I wanted to just start there because um, we're now going to be talking about how did we develop this tools inventory? Well, I think it's important to know what you don't know and what we knew um, when we were starting work on this project is that we wanted to hear, we needed the advice and insight of people who had developed tools for use in the adult maltreatment field and um, who also those who had used the tools. So we had a multidisciplinary panel of folks from adult protective services, from financial exploitation, so banking, the justice system and others. We also had folks who had created tools and tested tools. So that was useful, very useful to us. And these people represented the voice of the field um, so that they were really helpful to us in deciding what kinds of information should go into the tools inventory and making other choices that we made along the way. So we started by convening this technical expert panel. The, the thing that the expert panel did, one of the first things they did was to identify we when we were in the process of starting the tools inventory, we found in our quick review of published tools that there were over 100 tools that could go into the inventory. So the very first one of the very first things we did was talk to the technical expert panel about how do we focus this initial cut of tools into something that would be the most helpful to the field. And I would say here that there is hope that there would be an ability to expand the tools inventory to include other kinds of tools. But we decided initially to use, to focus on tools that screen or assess for adult maltreatment. And this would either be adult maltreatment in all its forms. So a global tool, like many of you said you were using, 74% of you said you were using, um, or it could be a tool that screened or assessed for a specific subtype of elder abuse and neglect we wanted it directly related to uh, to abuse of older adults or adults with disabilities. So for example, a cognitive screen like an MMSE or the MOCA, other tools that you might be using to do some sort of cognitive assessment, those are used not just in relation to elder abuse or uh, maltreatment of adults with disabilities. So those tools were not included because they are while they're very important to your practice, they were not specific to elder abuse 
or abuse of adults with disabilities. Um, we wanted it to make sure that these were tools that were designed for field staff and because some tools are designed for to be used in a sort of more research context so we wanted these to make sure that they were designed for your use in the field and that they did not require any kind of special license or credential to to use so you don't have to have an rn you don't have to have an md you don't have to be a psychologist to to use the tools in the inventory so all of those criteria were then codified into our purpose statement for the inventory, which is the purpose of the tools inventory is to identify and describe tested screening and assessment tools related directly to adult maltreatment for use by professionals in the field who interact directly with clients. The technical expert panel was also very helpful for us in determining what kinds of information would be most helpful to you. So, you know, when you're creating any kind of inventory, you're looking at multiple, multiple codes that you can input so that you can find the tool that you need. So you're looking, let's say, for a tool that will help you screen for self-neglect and you want it to be short and you want to see has this tool been tested before what kind of evidence base so we that those kinds of things and others were um, included in the tools inventory so for every tool that rob's going to go over you should be able to see what type of maltreatment um, is this tool designed to screen or assess so psychological physical financial sexual neglect uh, self-neglect or mistreatment broadly who were the intended audience or users of this tool? Is it uh, social human services, which would include adult protective services workers? Was it designed for medical or healthcare folks? Um, emergency medical responders? Was it designed for attorneys or legal professionals for financial services or others? How many items comprise the tool? Um, how, what's the format of the tool? Is it a, is it a paper tool um, that you would read from for in, with the client is it um, done on the computer it's that is it just is it are you observing the client and then noting things on the tool how is it administered is it um, administered by a professional some tools are actually given to the client to fill out and then turn back to the professional but it is basically self-administered some tools are administered by a caregiver so that describes format and how it is administered. Is training required for the tools? It was important. Sometimes we heard from the field that we you want a tool, or people want to use a tool, but sometimes the barrier of having it need need significant amount of training was a barrier to using the tool. So what's the tool? What's the training length? Is it um, just some tra brief training? So that would be less than three hours. Some training between four to eight hours, moderate training is required between eight and 16 hours, or extensive training is required. We also wanted to make sure that if the tool was copyrighted, we honored that copyright and gave you information so that you would not violate copyright status. Um, but also we gave you information about how to reach the tool developer because some, some tools, while copyrighted, um, tool developers are happy to let the field use them, but you just have to write for permission. So I would say that a, a lot of the tools, even if they're copyrighted, you should not be discouraged from using them, especially if you just contact the tool developer, if the information is there for that person and get permission from that person to write. And then finally, not last but not least at all, is what was the overall evidence rating for the tool? And Rob, I'm gonna turn over to Rob now to talk about what, what What's important about evidence and how did we come up with an evidence rating for the tools inventory? So, Rob? Okay, well, th thank you, Mary, and thank you for uh, to everyone who has joined us here today. Mary, can you bring us to the next slide, please? So, why is the level of evidence important? I mean, essentially, we're trying to highlight tools that will provide you information that is useful to you in your practice, and they'll enable you to provide services to uh, individuals who are, you know, at risk or experiencing maltreatment, um, and you know, help you to guide them to the services and supports that they may need. 
Now, one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at the tools, and it's something that Mary and Stephanie have already introduced is, the transition to an evidence-based field for APS, it's still fairly new. So for that reason, um, there, there are some quality tools or tools that we believe are quality tools in the inventory that may not necessarily have a very high evidence rating, but that does not necessarily mean that they are poor tools or ones that you should not consider in your practice. What it typically means is that those tools are fairly new in their development and have not been tested extensively yet. Uh, when we we're doing our work for this project, we had to set certain parameters for the research that we examined. And one of those parameters was stopping our literature review in the winter of 2019 in order to you know, finalize our process for uh, conducting the, the review, finalize our methodology for displaying information and finalizing our process to actually rate the evidence uh, available. So we had to put a firm date in place. You know, since that point, and even, you know, for some of the tools that we've included in here, additional research has been developed and has been published. Um, we were unable to include that information just because we had to put that hard stop in place in order to move to the next phases of the project. Now, as we were reviewing the evidence, the three main the three main things that we were really taking a look at were uh, the validity of the tool, the reliability of the tool, and the usefulness of the tool. Um, and we set up some you know, fairly rigid criteria to take a look at those things that we then um, presented to a series of external reviewers um, to give us an objective, fair, and non-biased manner. Um, in this case, we engaged with a group of you know, doctoral students in a uh, evaluation statistics uh, graduate program at a university here in the greater DC area and had the, you know, essentially the chair of that department act as an overseer. Um, this enabled us to work with folks who are highly engaged in the research literature, highly engaged in psychometric um, analysis, and we're, and we're you know, unbiased by um, you know, their own personal feelings about the field. Um, they were really, functionally, they're just really looking at the numbers that were available uh, once these tools were tested uh, in various forms and fashions. Now, we, when we put this together, we kind of, we envisioned it having two audiences. The primary audience is essentially those of you who are here on this uh, webinar, uh, it's the practitioner community. You know, people who are really looking for uh, tools that can improve their practice and improve uh, the, the outcomes of investigations that are occurring in the community. And as Stephanie said, our secondary audience uh, was the research community. Um, in order for this field to uh, move further into becoming an evidence-based field, more research needs to be conducted. So we need to have you know, experts, university professors, uh, researchers, who uh, we want to inspire them and have them take a look at, at these different tools, perhaps some that you know, they themselves have developed, and take a look at what uh, that fair and objective analysis um, led us to, and perhaps inspire them to conduct for further research either with uh, different populations or, um, you know, different populations, you know, broader populations, essentially building the, the level of evidence available for the effectiveness of these screening assessment tools. Uh, Mary, can you shift this to the next page, please? So our three main categories uh, for data quality that uh, we used when we are looking at the level of evidence were first validity. The validity of a tool refers to the degree of which it actually measures what it's designed to, to measure. Essentially, is it asking the right questions? Is it looking at the right items? Is it looking for the right um, evidence to determine whether or not someone uh, might be experiencing self-neglect or sexual abuse or financial exploitation? Reliability or reproducibility, repeatability, referring to the degree to which a tool yields results that are consistent each time it is used, or in other words, that the results can be replicated. Essentially, you know, if two people 
both use the tool, are they gonna come up with similar findings? It's gonna, is it gonna lead them to a similar conclusion about what is occurring with that individual? And then usefulness, the ability of a tool to identify a meaningful distinction between people who have a disease or condition and those who do not. Now, we have the word disease in here, which is more of a, uh, coming from a, a public health perspective and not, not a great word for, for our field. Um, but it's really, this is really about, you know, A or B, can, it, can this tool detect whether this condition, this experience is occurring or not? Um, you know, is it there or is it isn't, or is it not? So let's move on to the next slide, please. Now, as I was kind of describing, our inventory, um, when we looked at the evidence, we looked up across a number of dimensions and we weigh those dimensions in a way that gives us kind of a composite level of evidence with well-supported or supported being our highest level of evidence, promising emerging being uh, one tier below that, not yet established, still one tier below that, and then unsupported, which is a tool that uh, the evidence discourages its use, which as Stephanie shared earlier, none of the tools that we looked at came uh, came to an unsupported level of evidence. Now, when we're going to get into looking at where to find the inventory and how to use it in a moment, but before we do, I just want to put a, a little uh, caveat here. When you're seeing well-supported, promising emerging, and emerging or not yet established, you know, it's best to not view this as, you know, this is our gold standard, this is our silver standard, and this is our bronze, bronze standard tool. It really refers to the level of evidence that's available for that tool. And um, as you're exploring the inventory and identifying tools that um, will meet your purpose, it's it is a good idea to take a close look at the tool and you know, look under the hood, so to speak, and determine whether it is the tool that is the right one for you. Because uh, some of our, our you know, well-supported tools, you know, wonderful, beautiful research, but the types of individuals it was tested with could be very narrow and not re necessarily represent um, this constituents in your community. So let's move on to the next one, please. Um, which we've kind of talked about here a little bit, that the tool that not yet established or unsupported don't necessarily mean that the tool is of poor quality. It usually just means that it's fairly new in its development and that no tools receive overall ratings of unsupported. So let's move on. Now, using the tools in inventory. Um, Andy, can you... Uh, uh, Certainly. You need control, please. Thanks. Yep, I will make now, you the presenter and we should be able to see your screen in just a moment as soon as you um, grant permission. Okay, show my screen. All right. Now, Andy had a slide up a second ago that gave directions on where to find the tools inventory. And I'm just going to bring you there myself. So it is here on the ncaacl.gov resources tools inventory website. This is a URL that is in the presentation uh, handouts that you can um, you copy in yourself. Now, as you're navigating this page, you're gonna wanna look on, on the left-hand side, you have a series of hyperlinks and all near, the second from the bottom is the tools inventory. So I'm just gonna click on that, brings us back to the page. And if we scroll down, we have a description of the purpose and composition of the tools. And then the, this blue hyperlink here is the links to the tools inventory. Now this link will uh, allow you to download a zip file of the inventory. Um, zip files can be a little challenging to work with. The easiest way for you to be able to work with it is once you download it and unpack or unzip that file, transfer the entire file folder to the desktop of your computer. It's going to be the easiest way for you to navigate the materials. So I've already I've done that before our conversation. So I'm just going to show this right here. Have it on my desktop. I'm going to click on it, bring this back into view. So within the file folder, 
you have a readme document that talks about how to navigate uh, the inventory and a little bit about its background. And then you have this Excel sheet for the inventory. This is going to be your primary tool to navigate the material. So I'm going to click on that now. All right, let me just move this out of the way. So what you're going to see is a large Excel sheet with uh, approximately 47 rows and uh, what's that, about 16 or 17 columns. Now, there are a couple different ways to navigate through this material. Now, if we go down the list here, we can see all the tools that were included in the inventory. These are the ones that met our inclusion criteria that Mary uh, discussed earlier. Um, they're currently in alphabetical order. Uh, we have here tool family. So some of these tools that are included are um, related to other tools. They are offshoots, they are adaptations. So we tried to note that uh, in this column. You know, we then have audience and user, and we have you know, listed uh, in, the, in these boxes the different categories within the, that column. Social human services, healthcare, first responders, legal, financial services, and research. Uh, we've got our formats, similar categories, the number of items, which is a, an area that we were told uh, was very important uh, when considering whether a tool should, uh, should be, can be used in the field, the training required, and we tried to categorize this in, into the approximate number of hours uh, recommended for um, developing proficiency with the tool, copyright status, overall level of evidence, how it's administered, maltreatment type, uh, link to a website containing the tool. Some of the tools that we're able to find are essentially in the public domain. So when they were there, when they are available, we included links to them. And then who to contact for more information. Uh, so in some of these cases, um, when we weren't able to get an email address for the tool developer, we included uh, the research article that had um, items from the tool. So in some cases, the research articles actually, you know, will reprint the tool, but since that's still under copyright, we did not feel it was proper to uh, include that, um, you know, for free download. You know, we really, you know, think that permission of the author should be obtained before doing that. Now, if you look here, each of the tools in this first column, the title of tools, uh, they're highlighted in blue. That means that they are a hyperlink. Uh, when you click on the hyperlink, it'll actually lead you to a summary page of the tool that has all information from all of the columns that go across uh, horizontally. So just as an example, I'm going to click on the abuse screening inventory. It will bring up a PDF, which loads slowly, but if you scroll down and then scroll back up, all the material will be there. So here we have the title of the tool, uh, a brief, you know, one sentence uh, synopsis of the tool, some of the types of maltreatment addressed uh, by it, uh, intended user, the number of items, how it was administered, its format, training required, copyright status, overall level of evidence, um, link to article or resource contained the instrument. In this case, uh, we weren't able to do that. And then uh, who to contact for more information. In this case, this is a researcher uh, at a university in Sweden. Now, on this page, we also have a couple of additional links. So um, if you want more information as to how we came up with these composite levels of evidence, this additional evidence rating details for researchers, actually let me get to that in a second. Um, the levels of evidence down here at the bottom, unsupported, not yet established, promising, emergency, emerging, and well supported or supported. We, the, the sentence below additional information on the evidence review process, if you would click that link, will allow it to go to that page 
And this here describes the process for generating that composite overall level of evidence. Uh, essentially, it's, 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 it's kind of a, a majority rule type process where if you have you know, th three areas that are considered well-supported and supported, one that's considering promising emerging, then it was considered promising or it was considered well-supported or supported. But there are more details as to how that was done uh, by our external evidence reviewers here. If we click here, the additional evidence rating details for researchers, this is where we can kind of get under the hood of what the evidence reviewers looked at and what they found. So I'm going to click on that link now. Once again, allow access. And here we can take a look at you know, the articles that were used during the review. Uh, so we have, in this case, two were used, the overall evidence rating. And then for each of our reviews, we had two reviewers working. So we indicated what each of them came up with for each of the dimensions, some of the strengths and some of the future research recommendations that they found uh, under this dimension. Um, we're, we frame this as future research recommendations and strengths um, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, the first being the strengths are just things that the reviewers found in the evidence review during the evidence review process when they actually engaged with the research literature. So just because in almost all cases, certain things were highlighted and we, we uh, went through a categorization process in order to uh, include them into this section of the inventory. Um, but even if something doesn't necessarily have a strength listed here, once again, does not necessarily mean it's a bad tool. Uh, the future research recommendations, uh, we felt it's more appropriate to frame it this way rather than as a weakness, uh, but, because this is essentially some of the you know, guidance that would probably come out during a peer review process, recommendations to the research as to how do you make this article uh, better? What would be some uh, next steps that could be done to improve the level of evidence? So this, these future res research recommendations are really hitting on that secondary audience of researchers where we hope to inspire uh, them to uh, do some more work with these tools and uh, further enhance the evidence behind them. Um, you now, if you want to take a look at what's included in these different dimensions, we include links for that uh, on this uh, more detailed view of the tool. So once again, we're going to allow access. And this here brings you to a page that you know, hits on the major areas of consideration that we asked each of our evidence reviewers to focus upon when they were doing the review. So for usefulness, we're talking about sensitivity and we have a definition, specificity, definition, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. For data quality, uh, reliability and internal consistency, we have a few key considerations. Uh, face and content validity, once again, we have uh, a description for what we would like them to look at, look at and how we want them to consider these factors and then data quality criterion and construct validity. And we have definitions for those items. Now I'm gonna click out of these items here for a moment and bring us back to the main inventory. Um, so as you can see, this is a large Excel document and at first glance, it could be viewed as unwieldy. There are some tips that we can apply to this inventory in order for us to help us find information more quickly. Um, one of the things that we've done over the last couple of months is we fielded questions from uh, some APS agencies uh, across the country, uh, particularly you know, during this uh, during the global pandemic, where uh, agencies are wondering how do we conduct uh, screening and uh, and assessments with individuals when it's unsafe to actually interact with them. Um, are there any tools that can be used over the phone? 
Uh, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of tools that have been tested extensively over the phone. But what we can do is see from this inventory, you know, if any have been. So what we would do is we'd press Control and F, and it'll bring us up a uh, find and search box. And we can put in phone, find all, and we have one tool that ha that in the research that we were, we reviewed did discuss conducting their interviews and questionnaires over the phone. In th that case, it was the Abuse and Violence Against Older Women, or the AVAL. Um, this is a tool that was generally used with social and human services. Uh, there are two versions of it, a 22-item brief version and a 34-item standard version. We were unable, close this, we we're unable to find information about the training or its copyright status. But when we examined it, um, its overall level of evidence was promising. So this is a tool that you know could be considered. Um, it could be administered in one of two ways, either uh, as a self-administered tool where uh, an individual would fill out the questions themselves, or it could be administered by a professional. And it looked at various types of abuse, physical, psychological, financial, sexual, neglect, and others. Uh, in this case, rights violations. And for more information, uh, we would contact Gertz Lang at uh, the Research Institute of the Red Cross in Austria. Uh, the tool is in English, um, but this was the this is the contact that we were able to identify for this tool. Now, one of the things that we know that's important is the ability to identify the right tool for the right concern. Now, um, we have in this inventory, we look at many types of maltreatment. Now, there are two ways for us to screen and identify tools that can be used for a particular form of maltreatment. Um, one thing that we can do is we can take a look at these uh, boxes here and manually check the boxes that meet your criteria. The easier way is to unselect all of them and put your criteria into the search box. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search for um, neglect just as an example. And that will automatically fill each one of these boxes that have neglect as one of the components within that tool. If I hit OK, this here will list, it'll bring all the tools with neglect as one of the maltreatment types uh, examined by that tool to the top of our list. So it looks like we have quite a few. Um, it looks to be about 42 tools. Now, I'm just going to go back, and we can also, you know, just as a second example, let's search by uh, respondent. So, let's see. Let's try social and human services, which would be, which is how we categorized adult protective service workers. So I'm just going to put in social. That'll be enough to get us what we need. And once again, it resorts the inventory um, so that you can look at all the tools that include social and human services as one of the audience members or users. So the AVAL, the BASE, the CASE, uh, the CTS2, the EDMA, uh, the EADDS, the you know, easy LTC, the ESNA, the EPAS, et cetera. We have quite a few uh, that have been tested um, with social and human services, in most cases, uh, APS workers. Right, so I recommend you actually don't save, so we don't, you don't introduce any glitches into your, your uh, download. So I'll bring us back to this. Okay, 
Andy, can you uh, bring us back to the slide deck, please? I will do that. So, Mary, I'll make you the presenter again right now, and it will share your screen whenever you're ready. Perfect. Great. All right. And we're actually uh, getting ready to hand back to you, Mary. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rob. And you know, as Stephanie said at the beginning of the presentation, we do hope in the next three to six months to be able to take all the information that Rob just so you carefully went through with you and put it in a, a platform that would be, I think, a little bit more user friendly. The information won't be changing. It will be there. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows where to find the tools inventory. It is not on the ACL website. Um, it is on the National Center on Elder Abuse website, and there highlighted is the URL for that. Um, so these next slides we, we went over already, like how do you get to those? How do you open up the inventory and how do you basically how do you use it? Um, and there we had the demonstration. So, yeah, I just wanted to wrap up by saying again that um, th I think there are a lot of tools out there that are currently not being used by Adult Protective Services that even if the tool was not designed specifically for APS could be really helpful, could be a sharp knife in your, in your drawer for use by Adult Protective Services. Also, we are just really hoping that that there will be opportunities for APS maybe to identify a tool that they would like to test and work with researchers to test the tool so that you do know whether it's you know valid and reliable and useful and therefore then could be used by other adult protective services programs around the country and I think it's I think it's amazing that there were already 46 screening tools and more than a hundred tools that we thought would be useful to the field um, so what we're going to be doing in terms of next steps for this project is to continue to disseminate, just like we are today, information about the inventory. And we would love it if you could help us with that process by telling other people about the inventory. Um, we will continue to uh, update the inventory as new tools become uh, known to us. So again, if you are someone who is developing a tool or has tested a tool in your program and you think it should be in the inventory or you have additional, it is in the inventory already and you have additional information, we're collecting that on an ongoing basis and would appreciate your assistance. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a hope that we could expand the tools inventory and we would have a section that was like, hey, what are you looking for? A screening and assessment tool? That's here. Are you looking for, which would be a screening and assessment for adult maltreatment? Perhaps you want to screen and assess for um, functional ability, cognitive ability, ADLs, IADLs, uh, geriatric depression, uh, alcohol use. They're, you know, the sky is the limit. We just need to um, be reasonable in terms of what, um, in terms of talking to the field about what it needs and it will I think be it's already an incredibly useful tool for adult protective services and the field at large I think it could continue um, to be even more useful as we can add those other tools including um, all the information that we've already put in for the screening and assessment tools plus an evidence review so we would love to see if you have any questions for any of us today we also are leaving you with a question. If we were able in the future to expand the tools inventory, if you don't mind putting into chat, what other kinds of tools would you like to see included in the tools inventory? But I'll pause here and uh, go back to Karen uh, to see if there are any questions for us. And thank you all. Wonderful, thank you so much, Mary. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind navigating to that last slide in the slide deck. That one? Oh, oh uh, the, the very last slide that's in the, the set of slides that has the APS TARP contact information. Uh, you, maybe go back one where it has. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, just want to make sure we got, we got there. So this last slide has the contact information for the APS TARP in case you'd like to reach out. And I will get into reading a couple of the questions that came in. So one of the questions is I work in the brain injury field and I'm wondering if there are any tools that address both cognition and maltreatment. Hmm. 
Well, we purposefully um, st stepped away from tools that got us close to uh, cognitive screens, which were outside of our scope. Uh, during our early scan of the literature, we did identify a number of them, but once we engaged with our technical working group and uh, received you know some you know further uh, direction and guidance from ACL, we put that material aside in order to func to focus strictly on tools um, that were that fell into this screening assessment uh, domain. Um, so, in short, uh, there we I believe that they're out there, but they were not examined closely during the development of this inventory. Great, thank you. Another question. Could these assessment tools be used without management program approval uh, when working in APS? Uh, that I, I, I don't feel comfortable answering. <laughs> Oh, if, if I, I'm, this is Mary. I'm just going to guess that this is, this, this is somebody, I, I want to make sure I understand the question. Somebody's saying, you know, if I'm a line worker and like, oh my gosh, this self-neglect um, assessment tool looks like it would really be useful to me in my practice. I guess the, the question back to you is like, are you, is your program, does your program have a culture of encouraging you to use whatever tools you can find to do to, you know, to do your work. Um, going back to my analogy of the sharp knives, like, okay, maybe sharp knives might not be the best analogy. I'm going to come up with something better next time. But, you know, if, if your work, if your project, if your program encourages you to identify, yeah, I, I, I agree with Rob. We don't, we're not telling you what to do, but um, that uh, the tools are there for anyone's use as long as you are um, careful to make sure that if they're copyrighted, you're asking for permission to use it. Great, thank you both. We had a comment come in noting opioid misuse screening tools that are specific to the older adult population would be wonderful. Okay. Awesome, good idea. Um, There was another question. Um, is there any ranking system for the tools that you have included? I mean, there is the overall level of evidence, but um, I think that it's it's worthwhile to not put. Um, I think it's important that when you do a search for tools using this inventory, um, that you're going to get a number of tools and you'll see some that you know, are well supported, some that are promising emerging, and some um, that you know, haven't even reached, uh, has, haven't reached those two ranks. Um, I think it's important to, when you're looking at what the overall level of evidence is, you really, they're not necessarily, this is the gold medal tool, this is the silver medal tool, this is the bronze medal tool. Um, what those rankings are telling us is that the available evidence is supportive of their quality. Um, with, so, with some of the promising emerging tools, that kind of that, that second tier, um, those were one, some of those I viewed as very interesting because they focused on specific uh, populations. So, for example, I believe there's one or two that are focusing strictly on uh, Native American elders, um, primarily due to the sample size that the researchers worked with when they're developing that tool. In some cases, that's the main reason why that tool is not considered well supported. That's kind of top tier. So, I would put some weight into the into those rankings. But I think it's valuable to take a look under the hood and just and to see whether or not um, there is one that might have been used specifically with the population um, or background of the individual that you're 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 working with to see whether or not there's there's one that has a particular specialty that might be good for you. Great, thank you so much.
All right, so we are right on the hour. In order to be mindful of, of time, I'm going to conclude today's webinar. Thank you all again to those in the audience for attending today, and thank you so much to our presenters. We very much appreciate your time and expertise in sharing that with us. And um, I hope that everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.